Welcome to the Magic Minds Podcast. Today's episode is with Donald Hoffman. Dr. Hoffman is one of the most brilliant minds out there. And he is one of the hottest guests on the internet for podcasts all around because of the wild work that he and his team is doing. In a nutshell, they are questioning the foundations of reality with mathematical and scientific models showing one of which that the chances that we can see reality, that humans can see reality, according to their models is 0%. Meaning that there's a 0% chance, according to his team at UC Irvine and MIT, 0% chance that what we are perceiving is reality. Dr. Hoffman's work is also upending hundreds of years of thought and theory within his field, within how we all perceive the world around us. And so we talk about navigating that from an inner side of things, the inner journey of going against what nearly everyone, the shoulders of the giants he has stood on, what everyone has said about reality and yet doing it meticulously, winning people over left and right in an amazing TED talk a few years ago that really put his name on a lot of people's radars. But as brilliant as he is, he is just as good of a communicator. So without further ado, let's get into it with Donald Hoffman, today's episode of the Magic Minds Podcast. Cheers, Dr. Hoffman. Thank you very much, James. Great to see you again. Cheers. Um, Cheers, yes. This is, so this is the second time we've been able to have a podcast conversation, and I'm hopefully much more equipped for this topic, this go around, mm -hmm. because it is, well, it's such a fascinating topic to begin with, mm -hmm. and um, I'm going to make sure that listeners don't feel like they need to listen to anything other than what we're talking about here to prepare so to speak, okay. but this is, you are the, <clears throat> I think one of the most fascinating humans on the internet right now with what your work is saying, with what you've been saying for, mm -hmm. um, I think the biggest, the first time I, I saw you come on the scene was, was about eight years ago or so on a TED talk. Yes, yes. And uh, beautiful, a great TED talk that um, we'll get into those kind of, mm -hmm. the meat of that TED talk in this episode, but if people wanna watch anything outside of this one, uh, it's that's a great one to go to because uh well it lays out so much of what you have now become known for so crisply yes. before we jump into any type of um part two of our first conversation do you mind giving listeners a little bit of background on yourself from your own words okay yeah i i, I grew up in southern california i was born in texas in San right. Antonio in an army hospital. My dad was in the army. Oh, awesome. Uh, but when I was six months old, they moved out to California. So basically, I'm raised in California. Yeah. And uh, he had a master's degree in, in chemistry and did some technical work. And my mom had a bachelor's in biology. And so they were both educated and smart in the sciences. And they got into Christianity when I was around nine or 10. And my dad became a pastor. And so in my like middle of his career, he switched. Yeah, he career switched. Path? Oh, uh, wow, that, that's right. Yeah, he switched, and and it was a fundamentalist, uh, um, mm. Holy Ghost kind of Christian thing that he got into. So I saw that, and and <clears throat> so I was seeing what goes through your mind when you say say that that sentence out loud. I saw that. Well, it 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 was very different things I was being taught in church. Than what I was being taught in my science classes at school, mm. right? So at church, I was being told the Earth is around four thousand years old, and, and you know, in science classes, it was you know where it's in the billions, and and the universe is is very very ancient, and the Earth is billions of years old, and mm. so you know they couldn't both be right, and so I decided I would have to figure out for myself, and the question that I decided. As a teenager, I wanted to pose to myself was, um, are we just machines? Are people just machines? Or is there something- In that articulation. 
That, yeah, was, that was my art articulation to myself. Already I was aware of um, the possibility of artificial intelligence and I was you know, very interested in robotics. And, and so it, it occurred to me that if, and I, I was aware of computer programming. I, I started programming as a, in high school. And what year is this about? So I, I graduated from high school in 1974. So, so in 1973, I was programming. Um, maybe mm -hmm. even, yeah, probably 73, I, I was programming in 74. So, so I knew about programming. I, I knew the potential of programs to do really intelligent things. And so I formulated the, the question to myself, are we just machines? And ultimately, I decided to study that. I, I went to graduate school at MIT. Um, and what I did to study was I went into the artificial intelligence laboratory at MIT. So I was studying AI, <clears throat> what can machines do? And I was in what's now the Brain and Cognitive Science Department. And so I was studying <clears throat> human neuroscience and human psychology. Excuse me. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So the idea was, let me really understand both. Let me understand the, the state of the art of science of humans in cognitive neuroscience and the state of the art of artificial intelligence, which <clears throat> at MIT defined the state of the art at the time. One of the big areas that I'd love to discuss with you today that we'll, we'll get to here in a little bit is around just your own inner journey of this work around and proposing things that are just so right. <clears throat> contrary to what what all of your colleagues have, are saying, have been saying. Right. Um, and I imagine the general public, it's one of the reasons that you're such a fascinating figure and, and so well known is because we love it. But I imagine that's got to, well, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I would love to know if it's lonely from the colleague <laughs> perspective. But before we get to that, I'd love right. to ask, even just as a 16-year-old, when you were saying, okay, they can't both be right, was that a lonely place to be where you you don't know if what your dad is preaching from a pulpit, not just saying, you know, on the dinner table, but preaching from a pulpit is true, or you have doubts about that as a child, and then you also mm -hmm. have doubts about what the school is teaching you. That seems pretty lonely. It, well, the, the attitude I had at the time, I think, was that probably both have a piece of the puzzle and both probably have a, something wrong. Mm. I figured that they, they, they both weren't entirely right and they both weren't entirely wrong. And so it was up to me to figure out what parts to take from each and what to discard. So it really was not an either or, but what parts of the religious story are salvageable and what parts of science are reasonable and how can I put those, those parts together into a, a coherent story that that passes the rigor of scientific tests mm -hmm. but but also makes sense of the human aspect of of our existence mm -hmm. as well so that was sort of what i was going after and and i, I guess i'm not too worried about being an outlier um I'm good friends with, for example, among my scientific colleagues who are studying consciousness, but are, are almost all of them studying it from a physicalist framework. So they, they assume that neural activity or some kind of physical systems are required um, before consciousness could possibly emerge. But consciousness is not fundamental. And I would say that's 95, 99% of my colleagues. And, and they're good friends. Right? Mm -hmm. we, as scientists, they, they, we all make our bets about what, you know, you have one life, Today, mm -hmm. I can only do a certain number of things in, in science. What am I going to do? So you have to, and you don't know what's going to pay off. So you have to pick, you know, what you think is going to ultimately pay off in science. And so most of my colleagues are picking physicalism. And I don't feel lonely because I, I just think that's a bad bet. I think that mm -hmm. you, you're, they're geniuses. My colleagues are brilliant. Um, and they're making no progress on specific conscious experiences. And, and this is what I point out when I give talks and when I talk with them personally, which is to say, I mean, you've been at this for decades. What specific conscious experience can your theory explain? Taste of chocolate, mm. smell of vanilla, feeling of an itch. What is there any specific conscious experience that your mathematical theory or your, your neuroscience theory can explain? Mm. And, and there's none. And I think it's principled. I think that they, they, they won't. And so 
What do you mean it's principled? And I I love that we're about to dive into it. I've got one more question on the background. But but what do you mean by it's principled? Meaning that That, that it's not possible. In theory, it's just not possible to start with unconscious ingredients and boot up consciousness. It can't be done. So start with just unconscious matter. And if there's enough heat involved, if there's enough chance involved, boom, consciousness will emerge. That's or the right kind of programming, right? So that would be the artificial intelligence kind of, if we get the programming just right, mm, then, right, then these AIs involved. won't just be you know, giving back, like tin cans giving back answers. They'll actually feel something. They'll actually mm. feel love or they'll smell garlic. They, they won't just sort of record the data, they'll actually experience it is, is, is the idea. And you're saying <clears throat> it's just not possible, it doesn't matter. No, I, I think that they, they can't do it. And, and I'm not by any means the first, right? I was beaten to this by my centuries by Leibniz in his, so Gottfried Leibniz, who along with Newton invented the calculus. Um, he was, so he was a pretty smart dude. Mm. Um, uh, he, wrote a book called The Monodology um, several centuries ago, 300, 400 years ago. 300 years ago, I guess. And in that book, he has what's called his famous analogy of the mill. And he basically is saying 300 years ago, what I'm saying is that you can't start with mechanical ingredients. He's the mechanics that he had at the time, a mill, right? Some, mm-hmm. some mill for grinding flour or something like that. He said no mechanical system could ever lead to Perceptions, little real conscious perceptions, and and I've seen him quoted more recently by neuroscientists who say, well, yeah, Leibniz said that centuries ago, but he didn't know about modern neuroscience. If he knew about modern neuroscience, he wouldn't say that. And I'm saying no. Remember, Leibniz was a genius. Mm-hmm. He, he was on a par with Newton, and he understood that no mechanism of any kind will lead to perceptions. And so I think. Leibniz is right, so I don't. I don't feel very, very lonely. Um, yeah. I and there's also when when I know that no one's made progress on specific conscious experiences. But I'll put it this way: if someone in my field, using integrated information theory or you know global workspace theory or the orchestrated collapse of neuronal micro, neuronal microtubules theory, these are various current theories. If any of those gave me a, a scientific theory that said, Here, I can now give you the taste of chocolate. And this, this is the principle. I would stop what I'm doing right now immediately and, mm-hmm. and get on the bandwagon and start looking at it and say, okay, I, I never thought this was possible. Mm-hmm. But the fact is they haven't done it. Mm-hmm. That there's, and I have reasons to believe it's principle that it can't be done. So, so until any of them get one success, I'm betting strong against that. And, you know, and ultimately, if you look back at the history of science and, and, and human in endeavors, I mean, the first people that said the earth isn't flat, of course they, they, right. they, they were outliers, but, but who cares? I mean, who cares if you're an outlier? I mean, they were right. right. Yeah. And, and then when you, the earth is not the center of the universe, again, who cares if you're an outlier? You, you, you know, you, Galileo got thrown in prison for, the, for, for a while, he looked like he was the stupid dude in prison. For but we look back in history, and no, no, Galileo was the he was the right dude. Especially in the, in the context of um, <laughs> looked stupid, not only going to jail. Why is he saying this? Such harsh repercussions, but also uh, everyone's looking up and saying, "Of course, the sun is going around." This is so yeah, obvious. That's right. the, the Earth isn't moving. Just look. Is it right. moving? <laughs> right. And the uh, was it. Was it unique to study? And by the way, that story just it reminds me, I, I teach Advaita Vedanta here in, in yes. LA, and it's a philosophy that I, no one in the West really teaches. And someone asked me, is it lonely to study and teach this philosophy that, that none of your peers have heard of, much less study? And it was, it was, it was similarly, it was an interesting question that I hadn't, I hadn't considered much because it's, I, I basically said, it's, um, if you find a glass of water in the desert, uh, you're not asking like, man, this is lonely having this glass of water in the right, desert. Right, if you are right, parched right. and you need water, you're not thinking about exactly the social ties. In fact, I imagine in your work, it's the exact opposite is far more dangerous of I'm going to do this work because it's prestigious or because this is where it feels like I'll get the most, I don't know, social fanfare. 
um, <clears throat> is a really dangerous. I'm sure you you see that all the time with uh, with students or um, post grads that are going towards what's hip or in maybe in that vintage. Right, and and for me, it, I I knew that there was probably not going to be any you know pats on the backs uh, for, for this kind of work. Um, for a long, long time, because it's 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 not a trivial problem. It's not I'm not going to solve it overnight, and I'm going to be going opposite direction from what 99% of my colleagues are going. So, so yeah, it's going to be lonely in in that sense. On the other hand, what's nice about science is if you do good work, you know, it's mathematically precise, or you're you're doing experiments and they're all clean, you'll get published, and people they, they may disagree with you, but you will get published, and 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 so so I've been able. So this, so hats off to science because they've allowed someone like me, a, a maverick, to to do science and to to get published. I've had over a hundred papers published. Mm. So so it's not like no oh, no this can't possibly be right. <laughs> right. So we're not no no. Right. There, there, there's the, my colleagues might say I'm betting against Don, but you know as long as I you know in each pa- each particular paper give a a clean story and give the math or give the experiments, then they let it get published. So, so it's 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 all good, and you know, so and that's why science. I I really like science, and and I'll put it another way, they should do that to me. Mm-hmm. I'm saying something that's that's very very out of the the normal, although I think it's the tide is changing. Now yeah, it's in starting physics. to become. Yeah, it's, it's starting start, to become. It's starting much to more change. Of, oh wait, okay, maybe the Earth isn't the center of the universe. That that, that that's right, but but so. Uh, so hats off to science that they will allow mavericks to to talk. They won't shut them down, and that's really, really important. Mm-hmm. Now, we will shut down someone who's a maverick who also is not technically competent. If you're not technically competent, don't be a maverick in science because it's not going to – you'll get no and, – and for good reason, right? Mm. Those are a dime a dozen. But if, you, if you're but a do maverick – come across your, your desk often? <clears throat> oh, I get dozens every week. Uh, you know, ideas mm-hmm. that are uh, from people who clearly don't have the technical background, and so they don't know the literature. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can't play in this game unless you've actually studied for several years. You, you, there's just there's just no way, mm-hmm. right? You, you, there are, and it doesn't matter if your IQ is out the wazoo. There's oh, I bet those are the most annoying. The IQ out the wazoo that didn't finish university and then they're like yeah playing some role on the internet trying to get in touch with you well and it's sad because with that iq Mm -hmm. we we could use people like that but but you do have to be trained and you do have to you know get an advanced degree to to really make contributions um uh, that are going to be substantial because when i say that i disagree with my colleagues on this it's not that like they're trivially wrong they're these are Again, brilliant, brilliant people. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, among among the people who were thinking this way were Francis Crick, who won the Nobel Prize for his discovery of, you know, the, with Watson of, of the structure of DNA. Francis was brilliant, and he thought that neuroscience could give rise to consciousness. So it's not it's not stupid to think mm-hmm. that. Um, so, well, let's <clears throat> let's name some names. Who are the okay. your peers that you can't wait to prove? Wrong? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> you want to be a fly on the wall when they read? No, it's a, if uh, they read, and that is the uh, patience that you and I were just chatting before this, before hitting record on on patience. <clears throat> so that's going to be something that we touch on uh, in this this conversation as well. But we've been burying the lead long enough on <laughs> what your work says and. Uh, I would love for you to to let listeners know what you and your colleagues have been working on uh, for a f- several decades now. Right. But uh, what it says in layperson's terms for the nature of the, <clears throat> the world around us. Right. So the so the big picture of what we're doing and how it differs from most scientists is most of science has assumed that space and time or space time, the union of space and time, is the fundamental reality. That's been the framework for, for most of science for, for hundreds of years now. Is that humanity too? Not just science, but also um, humanity? Well, I would say 
Probably so. Most people have assumed that what you see, space, which is space and time, I don't know if they'd use those terms, but they probably would have used something like space and time. Um, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's not since Descartes, for example, that we would talk about space in terms of like coordinate systems and, and mathematics mm -hmm. and so forth. So so they might talk about space in terms of what they perceive, but, but science has taken space as sort of, you know, this coordinatized like Euclidean geometry or now uh, non-Euclidean hyperbolic geometry with Einstein. So, so we've assumed in, in, in science that that's the fundamental reality. But now the scientists themselves, in particular, high energy theoretical physicists. Mm -hmm. So the experts in, in space time, basically. So the high energy, many high energy theoretical physicists are now telling us that space time cannot be fundamental. That Einstein's theory of space time is great until you get to what they call the Planck scale, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters or 10 to the minus 43 seconds. And that then it falls apart. The Planck scale. The Planck scale. Break, huh? Breaking everything. That, that's right. It's, it's you know, walking off the Planck. Mm -hmm. and, and so what that means is there's no operational meaning to the notions of space and time. There's no experiments you can do. There's nothing, you can, there's, it, it just falls apart. And okay, so, do it for a late, and by the way, I had my magic mind this morning, so <laughs> I'm sharp. Okay. <laughs> and yet you're still going to have to break that down for me even right. further. Right. So when you say there's no experiments, so you're, if I were to recast it, you're saying that space time is conventionally seen as fundamental. If you want to research the universe, you look at the table, then you go deeper into the table to find its substantial structure and then go deeper to find its substantial structure from molecules right. to atoms right. to uh, quarks. And, and you keep going. And that's the direction if you want to study right. reality. Um, right. Or you observe things over time if you want to study reality. And what you're saying is it's almost meaningless to study in that direction, potentially meaningless to study in that direction if that's not fundamental in the same way that um, you speak about it often like a virtual reality headset. In the same way that you, you and I today put on a virtual reality headset and then I say run an experiment at that, uh, in that beaker. Mm -hmm. in the virtual reality and then now pour this liquid in it run what's happening and it's as irrelevant to what's really happening outside that virtual reality headset right right as you and i looking at this table or studying this water in this glass that, that, that's right so the that, that's a very good analogy james what's your analogy <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and what they'll say is look if you want to study more and more fundamental entities, you look smaller and smaller things, right? You, you go from what we can see like a table, now you go down to the molecular level, and then you go to the atomic level, and then you go to the subatomic level, and then go to even the particles that are inside the protons and neutrons and so forth, like the so-called quarks and gluons. So you're always going to smaller and smaller scales of space. And the idea has been that as you go to smaller and smaller scales of space time, you find more and more fundamental entities with more and more fundamental laws that govern them. So you're in some sense getting closer and closer to the foundations of reality has, has been the hope. The notion, yeah. But the, here's the problem. How do you look at something at smaller and smaller scales? Well, you have stronger and stronger microscopes. Now, well, what does that mean? It means that you, what the microscope is doing effectively is taking light, which is a, a wave, and you need to have the waves get smaller and smaller if you're gonna resolve finer and finer details, right? So you need to get light or whatever radiation you're using, but I'll talk about light, with smaller and smaller wavelengths so that you can resolve smaller and smaller things. That's what electron microscopes do and so forth. <clears throat> and that's perfectly fine. I mean, we, you can do that. In quantum mechanics is perfectly fine. But the problem is this. As you go to smaller and smaller wavelengths, Einstein taught us that the energy in the light is going up. Um, e equals h nu is the formula that he came up with in 1905. And then Einstein also taught us that matter and energy are the same thing in 1905. Mm -hmm. And in 1915, he taught us that matter, and therefore energy, warps space-time. It curves space-time. So and that's what we call gravity. When you put all of Einstein's stuff together, what you find is that as you get smaller and smaller wavelengths of light, the energy is going up and up. You're getting lots and lots of energy compressed into a smaller and smaller scale of space. That means you're compressing a lot more mass effectively into smaller. And at some point, 
you get so much mass in such a small region of space that you create a black hole and you destroy the space. You, and you destroy the very thing that you were trying to measure. So in other words, it will not only always elude you in terms of wood isn't the, isn't the substructure, there's molecules, then there's uh, atomic particles, then there's subatomic. So it's not only going to elude you in terms of just the number of pieces, but also even the laws as you get smaller and smaller mm -hmm. that it changes. But are you saying it, it will infinitely elude you because it will create a black hole if you if you keep going it will just you'll just break and, and so if you just say disappear well, is that the right word it will just disappear well what, what happens is that um if you say well i want to i don't want to just stop measuring things at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters i'd like to measure them at 10 to the minus 37 centimeters there is no experiment that you can do that will ever allow you to measure anything at 10 to the minus 37 centimeters. It doesn't you're not, exist. You're not just saying the technology isn't there today in 2024. You're saying like- It's in principle. You in cannot principle, do you it. Can, because there's too much energy is required to observe. That's right. The space time itself falls apart. It's sort of like if you have a database <clears throat> and there's some bottom to your database. You can't go You can't go mm -hmm. any deeper than that. That's that's the, the lowest part of your database. Right. Or, or in a, like, <clears throat> a VR headset, <clears throat> you can go down to the pixel level and beyond that, you, there's no, no such thing as the subpixels. Uh, that's it. Mm. Pixels are it. So now I'm not saying that there are pixels of space time. It's, it's just that the very notion of space time itself ceases to follow. It, it ceases to make any sense. There's, and, you, and you might say, well, I'll just try harder. I'll, I'll try to put more energy into my light to get smaller wavelengths. And all you do is make the black hole get bigger and bigger. So, so you actually get the reverse. You, you're not going to smaller scales. You're now starting to have the reverse, you're starting to go to bigger scales in some sense. <clears throat> so, so they're saying, and this is not me now, this is several high energy theoretical physicists. When did that start? Because eight years ago, <clears throat> that wasn't the case, at least from, <clears throat> from uh, what I was observing. Is that a fairly recent phenomenon in the last few years that well, there was these a paper, other high priests have started to? No, it's been around longer. So David Gross, who won the Nobel Prize I think in 2004 or something like that, but I forget. So he, he won the Nobel Prize for his work on quantum chromodynamics. And in a 2005 paper, I think Einstein and the Quest for Unification is the name of it in current directions or current science. Um, and what he says in the 2000, 2005 was, of course, the one century from 1905 when Einstein mm. published his theory of space time. Hold on, so, let me do that math. Just trying to be scientific. Yes, you're yeah, right. 1905 to I don't want anything getting through this, getting through these airwaves that I haven't personally yeah, checked. You haven't checked, right? Exactly. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm a total. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna. Be, you could say anything, mm -hmm. and I will admit this right off the bat. You could say anything in this podcast uh, around around your theories and theorems and i would just ha i'll have to nod because this is so out of my province but uh at least i can't help verify that hundred oh, that, that hundred right. year delta okay so that was sort of everybody was sort of celebrating the hundred years of einstein giving us the incredible switch in our understanding of space time and so so david gross did the 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 good scientific thing he thanked einstein and then he said now here's the problems Right, mm -hmm. so you, you first thank him for, but science always moves on. There's no such thing as a theory of everything. So we always are gonna look for the limits of our theories and, and move on. There is no theory of everything. And so David Gross actually has in that paper the, the phrase, space time is doomed. Mm. And so he, he talks about that. And then that's where you got that phrase. Oh, well, yeah, and it may be earlier, but but that's the earliest I've seen it. And mm -hmm. he he cites several other high energy theoretical physicists who at the time were saying things like that. That, mm -hmm. that we had to find something different from space time um, because it could no longer be the foundational framework. And you were two decades in at this point. If you started in 1986, um, two decades in, was that, did you already know that was coming or was that kind of like you know, a Tuesday you read that and you're like, oh my gosh, someone else like-minded mm -hmm. is saying something very similar or, or was this like, is this kind of like naturally happening in your circles over the course of those two decades leading up to someone else well, saying that? Yeah, I published a book in 1989 called Observer Mechanics um, with, with Bruce Bennett and Chetan Prakash. The three of us published that book. And it was a theory of consciousness outside of space time. So I was doing this. Mm. We were doing this and publishing it in 1989. So I've been for a long time thinking about space time emerging from 
consciousness um, in a instead mathematically of rigorous consciousness way. That's, merging from emerging instead from of consciousness time. merging from space time. So I was delighted to find physicists giving me backup on that, that, that they were saying, you know, we've assumed space time is fundamental and it's over. Space time can't be fundamental. And, and I should say, they don't just say, oh, why they, you know, was, no, no. They're saying fantastic. That means there's new vistas to explore and they're jumping outside of space time. And you might say, how in the world do you go do research outside of space time? Well, first I'll tell you, they're doing it. It's a big growing industry and it's getting, it's getting just got a grant for 10 million euros. Mm. It's, it's, it's called um, what they're discovering or what they call positive geometries. So it's a whole new field of, of endeavor. What they're finding are these mathematical structures entirely outside of space-time called positive geometries, including things like structures like an amplitudehedron, a sociohedron. I want us um, to talk about the amplitudehedron. Cosmological yeah. polytope. And then some combinatorial objects like decorated permutations that help you classify these positive geometries. So, so it's not like they're saying, oh, you know, space-time's mm -hmm. doomed. What, what do We're we do? We're all lost. No, it's, no it's in like, the last 10 years, wow, it's just in the last something. 10 years, they've discovered stuff. Stuff. Absolutely. They're publishing. So the amplitudehedron um, was discovered in 2013 and published in, uh, in, a, in a journal in 2014, but uh, as an archive paper in 2013. So 10 or 11 years now that we've had this real sort of breakthrough. Of course, there were you know, that wasn't the real start of it. I mean, there was intimations that there was something going on here even um, much earlier. But we really sort of... 2013 with the amplitude heat was sort of like the, you know, everybody was put on notice. There's mm -hmm. something really interesting going on here. And they've re really started. So that was Neymar, Connie Hamed, and, and Yaroslav Princeton, Trinka, right. and, and, and then their, and their colleagues that, that were involved in, in that kind of research. And they've, they've pushed it on from there. So in the last 10 years, the, the physicists, the high energy theoretical physicists, and, and that's, a, by the way, it's a small group within physics, right? There's many, many branches of physics. So this is a small group. Your average quantum theorist probably doesn't know this. They probably have never even heard of the, the research in positive geometries. I mean, I know because I've asked them. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I've, I've been at conferences where we're talking about consciousness and there are people with PhDs in, in quantum mechanics. And I ask them, well, what do you think about the amplitudehedron? They have, they've they never heard of it. They've never heard of these positive geometries. So this is, and, and no surprise, I mean, Physics is a really broad and deep subject, and so everybody has to know their little piece of it, and, and it's hard. So, it, but, so here's the piece. It's high energy theoretical physics. That's mm. the piece. This is their, their bailiwick, right? That's, that's what they study. And they're the ones um, that are telling us that it's over for space time. And they're saying, but there's hope. There are all these interesting geometries outside of space time. They're like obelisks. They're, they're geometric structures just sitting there. So we're not talking dynamics, just like. Meaning you're not talking moving or. Nothing it's moving not or waves. It's just the, sitting the, there. These structures that are sitting there with, with the, like, like a diamond. So it's got mm -hmm. faces and edges and points on it. And so that's what these things are like. The, some of them are like infinite dimensions. So it's, it's not quite like a polytope where you can see the whole geometry. So amplitudehedron can go off, it can be pretty big, you know, so. Trillions of <clears> dimensions, <throat> right, or something? I mean, well, yeah, they could have lots of dimensions. Yeah, countless, you know, trillions, yeah, trillions. Does, Typical does, stories don't have that many, but but in principle, yes. Yeah. Does, um, okay, so to, uh, I'm also from Texas. Um, so to uh. break it down for simple Texan, you're basically saying, <clears throat> such a terrible way to start a sentence, to tell a scientist you're basically saying. Um, but the gist of it seems to be <clears throat> to take the physical world as, as what is fundamental, as what is really going on, for lack of a better phrase. Um, there's a there are cameras, there are, there is this Don character, there are these microphones. These are real because I can touch them, I can hold them, it's, I can knock on this table, it must be real. And what your work and what it sounds like this tide is starting to turn, especially with um, this kind of local group of physicists that are most keyed in on this area, um, is, is saying that it's, what's really going on might have nothing to do with our perceptions. Right, it, it trans, well, or, or put it this way, 
the, the format of our perceptions. So our, our, our perceptions are formatted in terms of like a three-dimensional space and one dimension of time. And that formatting, we thought that that was sort of the ultimate nature of reality. And, and no, it appears to be this, that's just, that's just a user interface description. That, so that's- Tell us more of that, that articulation <clears throat> user interface. So, so yeah, I think the way I think about space-time now, I mean, we typically think of space-time, that's just the reality, live with it. That's, that's, and I'm saying, no, it's just your headset. It's a VR headset. And that, that particular VR headset has a uh, you know, particular kind of structure. It's a three-dimensional of space and one dimension of time. And, and it falls apart at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, so it's a fairly de shallow a VR headset. It's not 10 to the minus 33 trillion centimeters, just 10 to the minus 33. So we have a cheap headset. And that, mm -hmm. and we thought space-time was the reality. Not just a headset, but a cheap one. A cheap one, that's right. In my view, it's a, it's a cheap one. And science, for, for, for centuries in science, we thought we were studying reality and getting close to the, the fundamental nature of reality. And what we found is, no, no, all, this, all these centuries, we've just been studying our headset. And now, in the last 10 years, one group of scientists, namely high energy theoretical physicists, are taking off the headset and saying, hey, there's fun science out here. When you let go of the headset, there's neat, neat stuff out here. It's neat in the following, following way. When we try to compute particle interaction, what they call scattering amplitudes in, in quantum mm -hmm. mechanics. So like you have, might have two gluons smash into each other and four gluons go spraying out. And you want to write down the the probabilities, what they call the amplitudes, for various kinds of interactions. But when you do it inside space-time, so you use the language of our space-time headset, it's a mess. It, it, it's millions of terms for, you know, like two gluons in, six gluons out, and it's hundreds of pages of algebra. Um, a real mess. When you let go of space-time and you do it with the new structures outside of space-time, less than a page. Just a few terms you can do by hand. And Meaning you, you can predict what's going to happen. That's right. So you can predict what's going to happen inside space-time using mathematics of objects that are entirely outside space-time. Not curled. By the way, these are not objects curled up inside space-time. These are objects utterly and completely outside of space-time. So Okay. We're going to have to have you unpack that uh, for us. But before we do, is there a, in this user interface um, analogy, for you to describe, I've heard you describe it as uh, it is. It is like your iPhone, where you're tapping on what is the send button in your email client, or you're tapping on a face on mm -hmm. Instagram. But what's really happening? It's obviously not a real face. It's not. It's your screen, and it's not like when you remove that screen and you see what's happening in that phone behind that screen it's not like a higher resolution version of it it's actually these transistors all uh, a batter things that have nothing to do with a face whatsoever that are generating that that face you're tapping on and and that is a potential scenario of what's happening here is i'm interacting with you right now donald hoffman and the reality is not like I take off these blinders and, oh my God, Donald is this shining bright light that's 10 feet tall and even like more glistening. You're glistening right now. Well, not really, <laughs> but maybe a little in a little in an hour we might be in this. Uh, it's a little warm in here. But the um, but it's not like there's this higher resolution version, but only a low resolution version is coming. You're basically saying you take off the blinders, you take off the virtual reality headset and it might be so radically, it will be so radically different right, right. that it has <clears throat> nothing to do with two arms, two legs, Donald Hoffman sitting three feet from me. I exactly right. When you use your, your desktop on your computer, um, it's, you see colored icons on the screen for files and books and so forth. What's all going on in the computer for that book or that, that email and so forth is, you know, all sorts of, circuits and software and mm -hmm. voltages. And when you are writing a, an email or doing anything on your computer, you're toggling voltages and pre you know, millions of voltages in precise order. If you had to know exactly what you're doing, you couldn't do it. But it, you don't see anything like that in, on your desktop. You just see a little bit of eye candy that lets you do what you need to do to get your work done. 
behind the scenes, all this stuff is going on, and you don't know what's, what's going on. You, you, you press a key on your keyboard. What's going on is, is you've triggered millions of voltages changing in some kind of special order. Right. So why do you say cheap headset instead of uh, extremely elegant headset that does all of that work for you? Well, so, for example, we have three color receptors, the long, medium, wave, and short wavelength, red, green, and blue. Um, pigeons have four. Mm. Some uh, other creatures can have more um, color. So we, you know, we're not the, right, the best the sound in color. We can hear. We, we have limited range of sounds, and and our our space time headset falls apart at ten to the minus thirty, ten to the minus thirty three centimeters. It's pretty shallow. Not it's not ten to the minus thirty three trillion, and we only have three dimensions of space. I mean, I, I have all these mathematical problems that I'm trying to solve where I need to like visualize four dimensional or five dimensional or I can't visualize them. I feel really cheated. I mean, I, so if, if the problem's in 3D, mm. I can visualize it, and that's a real help to solving the problems. You give me a 4D problem, I can't visualize it. Nothing, and no one can. If you're Einstein, that's you can't wild. visualize yeah. it. So it's just like, why? What, what a dumb constraint. Four dimensions we can't do, five dimensions we can't visualize. So it'd be like what? someone that can't smell, yeah. and you're trying to explain bacon, the smell of bacon to them. Right. And they're like, I really, I will never know through words what you're talking about. I can't experience right. it. Exactly right. Or someone who's a flatlander, they only know two dimensions. And, you, and you're trying, you, you show them a, a square and, and, they, and you say, oh yeah, it's a square. But now can you imagine a cube? And they can't imagine it. They, they mm. just literally can't wrap their heads around the notion of a cube because they can't visualize it. Is there, <clears throat> is there a, so with the amplitohedron, for example, <clears throat> when you say uh, potentially a, a trillion dimensions, would that be our world has three or four if you count time, but for the amplitohedron, it doesn't just have like five or 15. It, it can have as many as you want, depending on the complexity of the... So, so there, the the dimensions are not about a space that you're thinking in. They're they're about the the possible structures of, of interactions of these particles. So, so the amplitohedron is about okay. particle scattering effectively and the, the various volumes and faces are, are describing how particles could could interact so it's a different thing than like just our, our current space time where you were thinking that it's like a container that we're in this is mm -hmm. a more abstract description of, of particle scattering uh, interactions but there it could be d depending on how complicated the particle interactions you want you, you could have that thing have millions or billions or trillions of dimensions how many can it <laughs> have in this in this uh, experience in the physicalist realm. Uh, well, well, you know, if if you were trying to model, you know, several trillion atoms, and there's more than trillions of atoms in this thing, right? so it's not a big deal to have trillions of atoms. Um, then you would need, you know, amplitohedron that was then astronomically large in its dimensions. Mm. <clears throat> okay, so um, w so you have physicalists, the ones that are like, nope, fundamental. Uh, the fundamentals of the universe are in physical uh, matter, um, and consciousness comes a, a, a from that. What do you call your school of, of thought or people that <clears throat> no longer believe right. in physical <clears throat> uh, matter being and space-time being fundamental? Well, so one way I would put it is to just say, instead of taking space-time and physical objects as fundamental, I take conscious experiences as fundamental. So that's mm. that's the, the flip. And the technical name I give it, like I call it conscious realism. So I'm saying I'm I'm saying this framework assumes that the fundamental reality is conscious experiences. So I call it conscious realism. And I put the word realism in there because I I there's another philosophical idea that's very similar to this called idealism. Um, Kant, yeah. for example, was a transcendental Barclay, idea, yeah. Barclay and so forth. Um, and and of, of course, what I'm saying is very very similar in, in, in spirit to what they're saying. But but there's been in many cases um, an anti-realist aspect to idealism, and sometimes even an anti-science aspect. And Berkeley, I mean, was came up with his his idealism partly in reaction to the science of Newton, and he, he was trying to push against the, the mechanism that Newton seemed to be um, leading to, and. So I wanted to to put my own terminology because idealism. There's so many varieties. There's so much philosophical debate about it. So I I wanted to say I'm I'm realist. I'm saying there really are conscious experiences, 
I don't know if I'm right, but that's what that's mm-hmm. what you. I should say I don't believe my own theories. I think as a scientist, it's bad form to believe your theories. <laughs> It's, 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 you, you, really? you, sh- you should understand them. You should push them to their limits. You should put them through the paces. But belief is just is not helpful, and 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 it it, it blinkers you. So it's mm-hmm. so it's best not to believe anything. It's 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 important to understand and do your homework and understand in great detail all the theories, even the ones that you're trying to disprove, especially the ones you're trying to disprove. But but so I don't I I don't. If you ask me, do I believe my own theories? No, I would say um, at best. My theory is a baby step forward, but it's by no means anywhere near a theory of everything. And I look forward to it being overthrown. What do you believe in? I think that reality transcends any description, ultimately. So that what science can do, and what it does very well, is to describe various perspectives on reality. And... This is something that spiritual traditions have talked about too. Where they'll say, like I think even at Advaita Vedanta, they'll say that the word um, is a pointer. Mm-hmm. Any teaching is a pointer to the truth, but it's not the truth. Yeah. Right? And Vedanta is like one of the only philosophies I had come across that said this is not the truth. What's in this book is not the truth. The okay. Truth isn't words. That's right. It is an experience. Th- th- that's right. So all you can do with the words is is use them as a pointer to the truth, but you have to find the truth yourself. Um, using the words to, to as hopefully useful guides to that. And so science, I think, is extremely valuable because what we've done in science is we've discovered how to make pointers that are very precise and where the pointers tell you, this is just a pointer. It can't be the truth. Look at Einstein's. His theory of space-time is a wonderful pointer, and it tells you not only the scope of his notion of space-time, but the limits, here's the limit. My theory falls apart at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. So that, that's where my pointer stops. And that's the beauty of science. The, the religious traditions will, will, will tell you our pointers are just pointers, they're not the truth. But they can't say, here's where this pointer stops. What, mm. what, what science can do is say, yeah, our pointers are just pointers too. And here's where our pointers stop. And now you need a new pointer. If you want to go, and, and, and then we do it. We start, you know, we leave space time, we find positive geometries. Pretty soon we'll leave positive geometries and find something even deeper, which is what I'm working on, trying to, f- to show something deeper than the positive geometries. <clears throat> well, there's, there's so much beauty in the uh, scientific method and, and not believing, not becoming blinded by uh, belief, belief or blind faith. But... Is there some substructure within just to in that spiritual and scientific uh, contrast where s- science can show you a great Titanic and uh, scientist can show you the end, but there was some spiritual background, which was the beginning. So your pursuit of this, is it science all the way through or do you think there's some, you know, science can give us truths, but uh and predictions and even control but i feel like spirituality can give us meaning can give us value things that science seem to not even try to uh they often don't give us right right so that's a great question so i'll tell you my own personal feeling about this and so my feeling is that as i said earlier the theories of science as powerful as they are can never be anything but theories of projections of reality. And the reality will infinitely transcend any of our theories. So I'm, I'm saying that there is and never, there, there cannot be ever a scientific theory of everything. Mm-hmm. No, no such thing. Because it will always require assumptions. That, that's right. Every, every it's, it's actually a pretty simple observation that every theory says, if you grant me these assumptions, I'll explain all this wonderful stuff. Mm-hmm. And the theory doesn't explain its assumptions, it assumes them. So mm-hmm. you might say, well, no problem, I'll give you a deeper theory that explains those assumptions. Yeah, you can do that. But your new theory will have its own assumptions. And this goes on ad infinitum. Mm-hmm. So, so I conclude that there is no end to the exploration of reality. So there's infinite job security for scientists. So this is the mm-hmm. good news. There, there, you don't, you'll never... You'll never get uh, you know, unemployed for, for science because there'll always be something new to, to study. What is that reality? 
right? So now, no words are it, right? No mathematics is it. So what I'm about to say is just a pointer, right? Mm -hmm. That's all I can it, all it can be is a pointer. I think that you are the reality, and I am the reality, just in different avatars. So that the the one reality is the consciousness that you are. That, that happens to be looking through a Hoffman avatar or a James avatar. And as a scientist, what I, I, I am the truth that I want to study. And my science is just scratching the surface of who I really am. And, and I've put on this little headset of four dimension, three dimensional space, four, one dimension of time, um, you know, Einsteinian kind of space time headset with only three color, you know, three color receptors and, the inability to imagine four-dimensional objects. I put myself in that little straight jacket temporarily and let myself look at my infinite reality from that little perspective and, and do science and have fun doing it and get lost in it, actually believe that this is the final reality, and then wake up. And in the, in the process of waking up, first by getting lost in it, I took it very seriously. I took this all very, very seriously and really played for keeps in some sense. And then at some point you wake up and what you discover is who you are by negation. Oh, I thought it was that, but I'm not that. I am much, much deeper than that. Mm -hmm. I'm much, I transcend becoming a billionaire. I transcend being able to fly to Mars and all, or anywhere in the universe. My That's arm breaks, you take my arm off. Okay, I'm not that. I'm not that. I'm not None the of breath that. coming in and out. I yeah. must be something different than, yeah, than right. this body. I must. In, in fact, anything that you could put in here, I'm infinitely more interesting than that. Infinitely. What do you mean, interesting? In, interesting. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm infinitely more interesting than anything that you could find inside space time. I completely transcend it, and, and, and you do too. So, what makes you jump to the conclusion there's two? Uh, just you brought up idealism and the oh, idea right. that maybe it's all a projection of of your mind. What makes that concession, very generous one, that I could exist as well when you say I am, when you, your words, when you said um, what you've, I've concluded is I am reality and so are you. Right. right. So there I'm using a little bit of dualistic language. Ultimately what I would say is um, there is this one unified intelligence, this consciousness, if you will. Again, these are all pointers. Right. That's looking, I'm, and it's looking at itself through a particular headset, and through that headset, it sees other, it sees itself as an avatar, and it sees itself as other avatars looking at it. And so, so that's what I call the headset, is, is basically the particular perspective that the one, so, uh, so there is So it would almost one. be like a virtual reality headset you have this capacity for one eye to look at the other eye. <laughs> that, that, exactly right. And it's turned at an angle to where you're looking at. That's right. That's right. Your own eye, and it and way more powerful than looking at your own eye. Each eye can dance, can talk. That's right. Can move. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah but, you're good. I mean, or, or I should put, I'm good, but I'm I'm you, so you're good. I mean, this is mm. truly you. You, we are infinite infinite intelligence and infinite power looking at itself through a, a really dumbed down headset and losing itself in it and then discovering something important about itself by by having lost itself thought it was the, this little 150 pound thing inside space time and trying to make a living and, and so forth and then waking up to the fact that oh no no this is this is all a virtual reality and i'm not that so how does the, see, the, the issue is how does the infinite intelligence, which transcends any particular forms, any forms at all, how does it know itself? What, what, how does it, what does it do to know itself? <clears throat> and it's, it's interesting that there are theorems that no, no system can really fully know itself, right? If I have a computer system, and <clears throat> you want the computer system to, to model itself. Well, you can have some software in the computer that then builds a model of all the circuits and software inside the computer. But in the very process of having the computer model itself, it has become more complicated because now it has a model that it didn't have before. Mm. So now I have to model myself with this model. 
But right. so you can see this never ending. So like you, taste buds that are tasting its own, their own, the moans themselves you, are not the taste buds you and I have. That would be something altogether different. And you get an infinite loop. Mm. You, you, it's an infinite regress. So, so every time that you understand yourself more deeply, then you've become more complicated. So you need to understand yourself more deeply, even more. And, <laughs> Preaching and so, to the choir on that one. <laughs> that's been a lot of work internally. Of uh, uh, <laughs> right. that's verbatim what it feels like. Um, mm -hmm. But okay, keep going. And, and as you're talking, does this this goes from. Um, and, and there are some uh, phenomenal conversations out there that people can listen to as, as uh, follow-ups around the actual math and the, around sure. your actual uh, the research and the models that you all have put together over the last several decades um, and especially um, over the last 10 to prove these things out as, as best as, as the math has ever proved these things out. Uh, that's where your renown is coming from is it's not just, hey, I'm throwing out this idea from an ivory tower, we're actually <clears throat> mathematically uh, showing this over right. and over and over again. Right. But I won't uh, go down that that rabbit hole around the specifics of of the math. But mm -hmm. I do want to ask as you as you're talking, going from what sounds like um, negation of other views, physicalists, uh, time uh, space time is doomed, and and then it does feel like it jumps to whoa. None of this is all a user interface. This is this isn't what's really happening. To but I think we can measure and start to piece together what is really happening with the right science. To then like a fourth act in the play, <clears throat> where it's like okay, I'm following you on on all of this, and then jump to maybe it's just one infinite consciousness mm. that's peering in on itself uh getting lost in this illusion of a 150 pound body walking around in right. this extremely dumbed down uh very fine almost infinitesimal if we're talking about infinite compared to the infinite this might as well be zero might as well be nothing infinitesimal like limit case for zero version of what's really happening that seems like a fourth act where it's like I'm following this movie. I love it. And then the fourth act is like, whoa, 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 whoa. Where'd you get that jump? Yeah, that seems like a, such a big jump. Do you <clears throat> get that reception from R right. so peers the, or the reason colleagues? where I The reason I go there is we, we published a, a paper, and people can read it if they want, called Objects of Consciousness, and also a follow-up called Fusions of Consciousness. And so if you just Google Objects of Consciousness or Fusions of Consciousness, the papers are available online for free. You can read them. <clears throat> what we do there is we, we write down a mathematical model of consciousness. And it's a bunch of these little conscious agents that have certain experiences, and then they choose. It's like a social network, like Twitter. And you know you, you have experiences, and then you do things to affect the experiences of other agents. Just like I get tweets, I'm following, and I tweet, and other people follow me, and 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 so information is being passed around. In in my social network, it's conscious experiences that are being passed around. Mm -hmm. And what happens? I write down all these little agents, right? They're little finite agents interacting. But the mathematics then says, well, but agents can combine. When you write down these little agents, the mathematics says, yeah, but those. Here's some agents when you have them interact that actually satisfies the definition of an agent. So they like actually droplets of water, they're f forming a bigger cup of water or something mm -hmm. like that. So, so the mathematics was what slapped me in the face. I mean, because I started, I didn't start off with trying to model the, the one infinite consciousness. I, <laughs> I like, what am I? How are you yeah. going to do that? So I, I just let me start off with really simple consciousnesses. Like I mean, I mean, drop dead simple. Like this conscious agent can only experience the color red. Period. That's all it can do. It, it experiences red and nothing else, mm -hmm. and a particular shade of red. And so I, that's so you start in, in science. You typically start with something simple and and build your way up. So I started doing that, but I realized, um, yeah, these agents can combine. And then there's, there's no big leap to go. Oh well, how how far can they to infinity and beyond? Right? There's there's mm. when, when I say to infinity and beyond, it's not just there, there's not just one infinity. There's an infinite number of infinities. Mm. This is called Cantor's hierarchy. So the oh right, I remember learning about this a while ago. Yeah, tell us what it is. Right. So the integers, like one, two, three, four, up. That's that's an, inf an infinite number. That's the smallest infinity. So we mm. call that the zero of 
like Aleph zero, mm. the, the Hebrew letter Aleph sub zero. And you could do 1.1. .1 then there's Aleph 1, 1 and yeah. Aleph 2. So what you do to go up, so uh, a guy named Cantor, a, a mathematician in the late 1800s, I think. Didn't he was, have a hotel or something as part of his uh, oh, visual? Maybe maybe that's <clears throat> I think else, that but, was so, someone trying to explain some aspects yes. about infinity. If they yeah. have used uh, something like about hotel room <clears throat> one plus two <clears throat> plus three, and you'd have 100 hotel rooms, you know, infinite hotel rooms, and then right, right. Uh, <clears throat> for listeners, and then it's 1.1. Hotel room 1.2, 1.3, <clears throat> 1 and then 1.11 right. 1, 1 plus 1.12 1 plus 1. Yeah, so that you have these infinite infinities that can add together. That, that's right. So there, there, are the, there are these nice examples to help you wrap your head around how infinity works. Because when you start dealing with infinities, counterintuitive things start to happen. That you can always fit another person. You're, if every hotel room is full, you can always fit another person in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's pretty pretty weird. But if you <clears throat> look at an, a set of objects, like numbers one, two, and three. So let's not go with infinity right now. Mm -hmm. Let's just take one, two, and three. You can look at all possible sub-collections. Like for one, two, and three, there's the sub-collections are, there's just one, there's two, there's three. There's the collection one, two, one, three, and two, three. Mm -hmm. And then one, two, three, that's another collection. When you, and then we also talk about the empty collection, what we call the null set. And when you <clears throat> add them up, there, there'll be six. So if you have three items, the set of possibilities for, for subsets, the set of subsets is um, uh, called the power set, and it's two raised to the number. So if you have 50 items, two to the 50th items are in the power set. Well, what's two to the infinity? Suppose you take all the integers and say, oh, well, that turns out to be a bigger infinity. Mm. So that's actually a bigger infinity. And, and Gregor Cantor was the, the genius who proved by something called a diagonal argument, I think in the late 1800s, um, that, <clears throat> that that was a bigger infinity. And then you could take the power set of Aleph 1 and you get Aleph 2 and so forth. So, so I, I realized that <clears throat> When I say that you're an infinite intelligence, what, what, what my mathematical model is doing is saying, I'm writing down a model of, of these interacting small conscious agents. But the mathematics is immediately telling me that there are infinite conscious agents and that there are probably infinities of infinities. You know, they're all up Gregor's. Mm -hmm. So there's no way I can, I, my mathematics comes back and slaps me in the face and says, there's no way, Hoffman, that you're going to measure or, or model the one. The one ultimate, or, or even at this point, even the notion of the one mm -hmm. becomes any simple idea of what we mean by the one goes out the window. You can see from what I'm describing here. It's not like 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 one glass or you know one finger. Right, that's why, and that's why they call it non-dual and non-dual philosophy instead of one, because even one exactly. If you try to model one, you're going to have some border around it versus not two, meaning you try to model not two. You can't really draw not two. I agree. But if I say draw one, eh, there's a hundred different choices you can make to visually try to represent one, and they'll all have a border around it. That, that's right. So non-dual is very, very smart kind of terminology here because it's when I when I it turns out that we can actually look at an order structure on these conscious agents. So this is, we haven't published this yet, so I haven't published this. This is, mm. this is for our next paper. Cool. Um, and we haven't even written the paper yet. I'm, I'm, I'm writing it right now. I was, I was working on it this morning. Oh, excellent. <laughs> and working us, on it yeah. yesterday. So it's a Markovian dynamics. And what we've discovered, so a Markovian dynamics is basically very, very simple. A simple example is, um, you might say, if it's raining today, what's the probability that it's going to be sunny tomorrow? And what's the probability it's going to be raining tomorrow, right? And, and it depends. If you're in California, if, you're, if, you're, if it's raining today or, or if it's sunny today, it's probably going to be sunny tomorrow, right? In California, it's probably going to be. But if you're, uh, say, um, in Florida, it might be a bigger chance that it's going to be raining tomorrow than, mm -hmm. than in, in. So you can have these probabilities. You can write down you know, probability of rain t tomorrow if it's or, or of sun tomorrow. And those are, when you write down those probabilities, those, those are called Markovian um, dynamics, dynamics or Markovian kernels. Mm -hmm. um, and so I use that to write down these interactions of conscious agents. If I'm having this experience, so the experience red, 
what's the probability that I will affect Joe's experience and make him experience green? So they're just a, mm. so I write down these Markovian kernels. So so the issue is that these Markovian kernels are the mathematical entity that we're we're studying, and we discovered what's called a partial order on them, a logic on them. One does one Markovian kernel entail logically entail another, and then so we, we discovered that, and then discovered that that tells us how to take the and and the or. So you, if, um, you might say um, it could be raining tomorrow or snowing. That's an or, right? What's, that's that's mm -hmm. rain or snow. Um, or you might say, what is, what's the chance that it's going to be raining tomorrow and sunny at the same time? Probably a small chance. I mean, there could be a little peak of sun. So you, so you can talk about and and or. And so we have a logic of and and or and entailment for all of these Markovian kernels. So for all possible conscious agents. So that allows us to then look at, quote unquote, the one. The, the logic, the, the logical structure of the one, and how all of its parts are put together. So I'm, I'm really. So this kind of just happened that you're able to quote unquote look at the one, and it was, the, and it was, uh, it was almost like, all right, we're over here. Right. We're not going to even try to look at the one. We're just going to have our tiny little corner that we're going right. to etch out and and right. mathematically prove out. And then you started to do that. Then we have discovered this logic, and all of a sudden we realized this logic then gives us the scaffolding immediately gives us an infinite scaffolding, infinite scaffolding, to, to f well, first realize how complicated the one is. I said, like, okay, non-dual is a much better word than the one for this thing. And for a technical reason, there's no global negation, and there's no single highest unit in this logic. Th those are technical ways of saying what you're saying, which is non-dual is a much better word than saying there's one ultimate agent. And I know you know this for, for listeners, Advaita in Advaita Vedanta means non-dual. Hmm. Vedanta means uh, end of the Vedas, these four textbooks. are, And it's I actually just did an episode where I mentioned you in it uh, and this work um, on my other podcast, The Daily Vedantic, where I don't know if I, I uh, told you this, um, and I want you to continue your thoughts, but the short version is I was in an ashram in India listening to a, a podcast that you were on while I'm laying on the bed huh. studying non-dual philosophy. Laying on the bed in the afternoon was kind of just a uh, quiet time. Listening to this podcast of this scientist in Southern California uh, talk about the mathematical proofs behind what you are perceiving may have nothing to do and what it looks like is that it has zero, not only nothing to do with <clears throat> what's really going on, um, even though it's it, like in Advaita Vedanta, the, the analog is always the dream you every night we have dreams where we're like i perceive other people and clothing and gravity even and i don't know what's going to happen dramatically in this situation and you wake up and you're like oh that was a dream it wasn't real my perceptions completely deceived me and then five minutes later we go on with our day of like but i can trust my perceptions now because <laughs> like even though five minutes ago was a perfect example that i couldn't right, right. and i was laying on a bed uh listening to a podcast that you were on where you were talking about the mathematical side of what this philosophy um, has, has said for thousands of years. But so importantly to why you're doing it, it gives us a scientific foothold. It doesn't require people to take a leap of any kind mm -hmm. if you can give them a scientific uh, foothold. But okay, so keep going on this, um, the non-dual aspect of it and how you went from that mm -hmm. foothold to <laughs> a theorem on the one what would you call <clears throat> well a, a, a realization that the math that the mathematics was was pointing to this unbounded infinity of consciousnesses so and, but 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 it doesn't look like there's any one top God, you know, there's, there's not there's not one. It's sort of like the whole. It's a really complicated thing to wrap your the, the the logic. It's not a Boolean logic, so it's a it's 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 and it's even more complicated than the quantum logics that are these ortho complemented um, modular lattices. It's 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 even more complicated than than those logics. It's it's more general than those. It's so it's a very very general logic. Um, stunning that we it, it, the definition is simple. It's it's 
truly s simple definition, but, be, but it would be too technical to go into right now. Are there any philosophies that uh, humans have come up with that, <laughs> that um, I'm b truly not trying to be an apologist for Advaita Vedanta in any way, um, mm -hmm. just happened to be where I discovered what you're working on. And I was like, holy shit, this is like exactly what this philosophy is, right. is saying. Um, but are there philosophies in your experience that that get close to this? Or where have we as humans gotten closest to what your math is starting to purport? Well, well I, I think the non-dual philosophies are the closest from the spiritual side. And, and I would say the mystical traditions in, in most spiritual, you know, so East and West. So, mm -hmm. so there are mystical traditions in Islam, there's Sufism, yeah. in um, um, Meister Judaism. Eckhart and Christian mysticism. Right? Yeah, there's Christian mysticism. There's Benedictine monks and, and their practices. There's um, Kabbalah in Jewish mm -hmm. mysticism. And, and, and so, and then of course, India and, and, and Buddhism and, and, and so forth. The, the, the Eastern is well known, so I didn't start with them because mm -hmm. that's sort of well known. So, so in all the spiritual traditions, there are these mystical aspects that, that seem to be pointing to the same thing. And so I, I was stunned to see the mathematics that we, so I was just trying to model individual little con consciousnesses, but when we discovered these logics, that's when I realized that this was pointing to a, a, a non-dual, especially when it was the, the logic didn't have a single unit at the top. So there wasn't, I couldn't actually talk about know, the How one. do you know that? How, do, how does, or is it, and I'm okay with the answer oh, oh, oh. of the math shows it. Uh, yeah, there are, there are, um, the and and the or are not always defined for, for you have to have special consciousnesses that you can actually take their union or their intersection, so to speak. Some of them are just disjoint and, and can't be joined um, in any non-trivial way. So mm -hmm. it's some of our are, are just completely incompatible. You can't talk about this consciousness and that one. They're, they're just not compatible in, 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 the, in the language of this logic. Um, you, for example, I, I can't say it's, it's, it, it's 100 degrees today and it's 99 degrees today. At, that, at, at this instant, it's just those are incompatible statements. One or the other can be true, but not both at the same time. Hmm. And so there are logics, um, and in quantum logic, you, um, you get certain kinds of instances of this kinds of incompatibility as, as well. So we're used to Boolean logics where you can always take the and and or, you know, but, but um, these are non-Boolean logics. And, and Okay, the, um, I'll take your word for it. Um, the, the last question that, uh, that I have for you on the science, and then I want to ask you just as we round out the episode, I, I really want to know on the personal side, um, what we touched on in the beginning of just what it's like to do this kind of work that is now getting such a heavy spotlight. Um, but, uh, before we get to that, Jung, who was a Vedanta himself, he, he, um, he said that death was as as meaningful to life as birth yes and and therefore um but the next question would be well is death the end and and you know he's on record in, in an interview being like well no it can't be the end if um it's as meaningful to life as birth um, my interpretation of that would is that a death is almost like its own birth. There is just an uh, birth is painful. Birth is the end of the womb, and it's the beginning of this separate uh, disunion kind of life between mother and child. And and death, um, in his view, is just another type of of birth, so to speak. Um, what does this? What are the implications around this for? our day-to-day -day lives, and then what are the implications for something as big as as death, if if there are any, according to your work? If space-time is fundamental, as physics used to think, and science, most scientists still think, if space-time is fundamental, then death is the end. There's no question about it. And, 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 and under those assumptions, Jung could not possibly be right. So consciousness coming from matter, when the matter's gone, there that's, can't be any consciousness. That's it. Exactly right. So if, if space-time is fundamental and not consciousness, then the, the death of the brain, 
is going to be the death of your consciousness and, and it's unrecoverable. Mm. However, space-time isn't fundamental. And you say that now, matter-of-factly. Where it's, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm now I'm just parroting the high energy theoretical physicists, right? This is their bailiwick, and they're the ones that are telling us space time is doomed. And is it is it kind mm-hmm. of like 19, 1930, You no longer, if you know the if you know the literature, you're not going to talk about space and time as, as separate. You're going to talk about them in a continuum because it's like this is incontrovertible at you know 1935, 1945. Is this right. similar to where this is incontrovertible? Um, it's more like 1922. Your- so so when um, Einstein won the Nobel Prize, it was awarded to him in 1922, but not for space time. That's right, yeah. It was for the photoelectric effect. Mm. And the members of the Nobel Committee, well, the Nobel Committee made it very, very clear that it was not for his work yeah, on space right, time, right? right. So yeah. like, hey, good, we don't we don't even well, we, condone that really. We don't even we're, it, it, we're really it, only speaking it, on behalf of you're right. That's right. That's right. So that's where we are with, with this space time is doomed. I would say it took a while for even. I mean, the, the people on the Nobel Committee, of course, were brilliant, right? The, they they did their homework and so forth. They they just weren't sold yet. Mm. Um, but but it was true that that Newton's space and time were gone, and. They were replaced by Einstein's, even though the Nobel Committee didn't know it. And now it's true that space-time is doomed, but only some high-energy theoretical physicists really And when you say doom, it's not going to end in three years or something, but no, you're no. just saying the idea of it being fundamental is so, is so doomed, it's, it's, you cannot re- recover it based on what we know That's today. Right. It's doomed as the foundation of science. Mm. The theoretical foundation is, is doomed. And... And so most physicists don't know that yet. So we're still more like the 1922 thing with, with mm. Einstein. Um, but I, I would guess um, this is a big pill for people to swallow, um, that space-time is not fundamental. So I, I, I'm imagining myself probably another couple decades before it really sinks in. And probably you know my generation has to die. It, 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 as I think, was it Planck himself that said that science progresses one funeral at a time. Yeah, I've heard it say of like what's right. what is uh what is new to one generation is convention to the next. Yeah, that, that, that's right. So I mean for a generation that um I mean right the the Apple Vision Pro is coming out right now. VR headsets mm-hmm. are going to be uh, you know much much more common. They're they're already very very common, but now we may actually be on everyday life using them for interacting with computers and so forth. A generation that's raised with VR headsets, the idea that space time is just another headset, it's not going to be. It's going to be, duh. It's, for us, it's like mind blowing stuff. For the next generation, it's just like you know that that took no imagination. Mm-hmm. Why why did people take centuries to figure that out? Well, mm-hmm. because we never had the technology to sort of help us think out of that box. Now we have the technology and it's helping us to think out of that box. So you're saying even <clears throat> you discovering this and, and helping push this forward, it'll still take you decades before it sinks in. I, I must say that my own emotions and my own cognitive, my psyche rebels at every point. I, I, I'm completely identified with space time emotionally, uh, completely. So I, I do meditate and in I get brief escape from the addiction to space time you know, identifying with my my body and so forth but but it, it's brief and so but it's changing it's, it's slowly changing but I, I, you know if I'd been able to um, be taught this and experience this and experience headsets early on in my life right like when I was three and be taught this and and, and just have someone take off the headset and see see Don now this is also a headset. Oh, then I would get it. I think, but when you've been taught for all of your life that this is the truth, and you believe that for decades, it, those circuits are hard to un- unwind. So I'm meditating and I'm, I'm unwinding them. Now, as a scientist, of course, I can just go ahead and say, it doesn't matter how I feel about it, I can just go ahead and do the math. And that's what mm-hmm. I'm doing. So I just do the math and follow the logic. And I may not feel comfortable with it, but hey, if the logic is clean, the logic is clean. You have mm-hmm. to go there, right? Quantum mechanics is weird, it, but the math is there, so you you you, you just do it. Um, so. On the, on the topic of death, has it sunk in? Of not the you now going to the grocery store on a Tuesday, but the idea of decades from now, there not being an end. 
Does that somehow sink in It's, it's easier? more and more sinking in. I, I, I should say that if consciousness is fundamental, not space-time, then it's a no-brainer to recognize that this is just a headset. Great and, pun. And, Great pun, by the way. <laughs> right. And, and, and death is just taking off this headset. It's, mm. it's nothing more traumatic than that. So now, if someone pointed a gun at me right now, I'd be afraid. Mm. Or if I was facing a cliff, and, and you know, I would be afraid. So now part of that is just, you know, my normal circuits that are important, you know, for everyday life. I don't want to cut myself with a knife and all these things. So, so I have the normal fears that you need to, you know, to not hurt yourself in the game. Mm-hmm. And to be of use, and not be, even just a self-preservation, to be of use to, to of those use. that you That's right. uh, love and identify with. That's right. But but ultimately, yeah. Uh, so I, I still, I have an innate raw fear of death, but I, I must say that it's um, it's moderating as I spend more time and really let the implications of the science sink in and, and really let my beliefs, my, my emotional beliefs evolve to match what I'm discovering needs to be true. I mean, it's one thing to intellectually discover something is true. It's another thing for your emotions to catch up. Mm. For example, you, you, can, you can be maybe stepping out onto a glass platform out over the, the Grand Canyon and, and told, look, this was engineered perfectly fine. Mm-hmm. You're going to be fine. And you step out onto it and you're, you, you know intellectually that it's perfectly fine. And you step out there and you're scared to death mm-hmm. because your visual system is looking at empty space below you and says you need to be scared. So that's sort of the way like I- Like a I, surgeon where something goes wrong and you know- if I don't get my shit together, yeah. then I, it's not gonna, I'm not going to improve the odds of fixing this. Right. And yet the emotions still, that, that, still is there. That, that's right. So, and, and the emotions, are, you know, they're, they're playing their role, right? In, in normal cases, you, it's right to fear death because I mean, that's it's a way to keep you in the game. Mm-hmm. In normal cases, you don't want to step out into empty, empty space over, over a, a mile deep uh, canyon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you don't want to do that. Right. So, so these are, are, are good normal responses to have. But intellectually, I realize that um, probability is very, very small. That those are correct attitudes toward death. I mean, I, if, if physicalism were true, then absolutely. Death is the end. And... Um, it, it would be natural to be afraid. But if consciousness is fundamental, what you're going to lose is this particular perspective on consciousness. You'll step out of this. Like when you take a headset off, you, you step out of, that, out of that game. But when you step out of one game, um, you step back into what we call this world. And so what is it that we step back into? You probably get that most in meditation when you actually are choosing to let go of your headset in meditation. That's what meditation is really doing is saying, yeah, when you die, you will take off the headset, but why don't you try taking it off now? Mm. Why don't you just sit there and the way you take it off is don't think, period. Let no thoughts go through your head. Just be sit there in silence and all of a sudden, and, and first, you find that that you, it's very that's easier said than done. Put it that mm-hmm. way. I've meditated for more than thirty thousand hours. It's still not easy. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, and and I've been doing it for twenty two years. So it's, it's I've spent a lot of time meditating. And you know the addiction to the headset and to thoughts and and the, the, this form is. It, I'll put it this way: the the infinite intelligence really goes all in mm-hmm. into the headset. It, it, it lets itself really immerse and lose itself and then slowly, painfully wake up because it's a death to something that you deeply believed. It's a death to think, I mean, I thought I was this 160 pound body and, and, and that what I did here in some sense, deeply mattered in terms of you know the things I build and so forth. But it's, it's sort of like when you're playing a, a video game, right? Yeah, it's fun in the game, but in some sense, once you unplug the game, that's that's 
right? not really you that get, important. You get called down to dinner and you're like, oh, this okay. is, yes. Yeah. It's, yeah, Kashmir Shaivism has this beautiful uh, an analog of just the, it's a, it's a play. It's, That's right. It is a game. And so the more that the play, uh, the game, is, the more real it feels. That's why we're chasing after virtual reality to begin with. It's yeah. not to do email better. It is driven by, in many ways, the gaming industry because mm-hmm. right. the game oh, yeah, feels yeah. more real. That's right. Sadly, it's also <laughs> driven by the porn industry, but we'll right, focus right, on right, the, right, right. The, the more uh, appropriate one uh, for a podcast of our, uh, of our intellect. Um, the game feels more real. That's why we're chasing after that and playing that instead of uh, and running to Dave and Buster's. If you're you know, a real big gamer versus playing Pong, you want right, right, to really right. get lost. Um, and that's the divine way of getting lost is to go all in. But that's a, uh, a fun way you, you put it of uh, that the infinite really goes all in. The, 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 that's right. And, and, and it's true that, that in some sense you walk away from it all and, and, and it's all lost. But what, what you've gained is you realized how rich that was, and then you, what you really gained was, I transcend even that. As rich as that was, as interesting as that was, I'm infinitely, infinitely more than that. Not just a little bit more, infinitely more. And I thought that getting that extra house or that extra fancy car or that extra billion dollars would really make me, in retrospect, I mean, it's fine to do that in the game, but deep down, trivial. Mm-hmm. To oh, want, even, to, math, to, even mathematically, I mean. Yeah. 50 acres, if you are the infinite, 50 acres, 500 trillion acres divided by infinity is zero. Is zero. That's right. That's right. Um, 500 trillion years. That's right. If you are eternal uh, of what you really are is eternal. Right. I say this on Daily Vedanta uh, quite often. It's that's it's not, this isn't right. a philosophy. This is math. Right. Exactly. That is yes, the limit it. case of zero. Exactly um, right. That's in comparison right. to uh, eternity. And that's 500 trillion years, much less the right. 80 or 90 we're all. Uh, scratching for okay the the last um question for you is is there i wanted to ask about your personal kind of inner uh, journey um but i actually just in this line of of questioning i kind of want to forego that we touched on that a little bit in the beginning of the conversation and just ask about um is duality so one of my favorite quotes around philosophy um and and certainly i grew up roman catholic and um Mm -hmm. christianity is this uh this catholic priest in the middle of the 20th century so 70 years ago said the christian of the future will either be a mystic or won't exist at all he was kind of predicting that the death of dualism within uh christianity and mysticism being for for listeners a, a synonym for dualism um union the pursuit should be a union with God, not uh, to sit, you know, beneath a throne, but right. to actually join and rejoin in union with the divine, not mm-hmm. some like cosmic king with a big beard. Right, right. <clears throat> the um, would you say this your work, or is this a bridge too far? Um, would you say your work also says that duality is doomed? Uh, yes, I, I would say that this this work is pointing in the direction that duality is doomed. It's pointing to there being um, just awareness as the fundamental reality. And and what we call our experience inside space and time is just one of an infinite number of projections that that awareness can take. So this is, but I, I imagine that there are projections in which you don't just have three dimensions of space. Mm-hmm. You could have 50 mm-hmm. or a million or a billion. Yeah, if you're the infinite, you can you can do whatever you not want. Not only go all in, you can do it infinitely at the same time in infinite Th- that's directions. Right. Everything, everywhere, ever, all at once. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, and of course, that that's sort of that's a multiverse kind of story. This is a little bit different than this is not a multiverse story. It's 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 deeper than that actually. Um, <clears throat> but that's why I was saying this headset it seems like one of the cheaper ones it's only three dimensions and, and, and so, <laughs> so forth funny to, I know exactly what you mean but it's it's almost because I know uh, what you're right. you're saying I'm like damn that hits it like 
right on the head. Th that's right. That's this a is a great way of saying it. Instead of, instead of being addicted to this round, say, well, of course, this is the final reality. Like, no, no, this is the, one of the cheaper possible headsets <laughs> um, th that are out there. I can't wait to you know take take this one off and uh, try a better model. I mean, yeah. that, that'll be more fun. Um, well, there are others. There are so many schools of thought of multiple mm -hmm. planes and multiple astral spheres, and uh, but uh, there's. I I like kind of the recognition of this is a headset. Then it's a that's kind of a lost cause to be like. I wonder what else is there if you have a chance to uh, to get to that awareness. Um, well, I, I will say one thing: the the amplitudehedron has it, it's defined on several it has several defining parameters n k and m and, and z one of the parameters m is the dimension of your headset so four so when m is four the amplitude hedron is giving you scattering amplitudes for for our little headset but mm -hmm. it could be eight it could be a billion it could be whatever you want so so already this, this is one of the positive geometries that they've discovered outside of space-time. In that positive geometry itself, one of the four defining entities for that, that structure, M, the, the, the variable M, is essentially your headset dimension. And we happen to have one of the smallest possible ones, four. Mm. Um, you know, there's only three smaller ones that you could have. <laughs> yeah. Three, two, one. And, and we have almost like the, the, the smallest functional one. So we, we got the cheapest one that's sort of Non-trivial in some sense, uh, but but M could be anything you want, and and there's an amplitude hedron for it. So already, we're, the positive geometries that we're discovering outside of our space-time headset are already pointing to the possibility of all these other headsets. Now, I'm, I'm not saying the theoretical physicists are saying that. I'm saying that's my interpretation. So I'm mm -hmm. so what I've just said now. I'm not saying any theoretical physicist would would. Um, they would agree that M is the, the dimension of the space-time and so forth. So they would agree with that. Um, and they would agree that in principle, yeah, M could be eight. And we could then study a quote-unquote space-time with, with more dimensions and so forth. So, so mm. they would agree with me on that. The, the part where I'm saying, okay, this, this, so this is consciousness now. So then, then they might say, okay, we're off, the, we're off the wagon on when you start talking about consciousness. So, so now I'm on my own here. Yeah. But I'm saying consciousness can put on any headset that it wants. And it corresponds in this little example of the absolute hedron to M being any value that you want for any dimension of it. But of course, that's just one way that headsets can, want, can vary. Okay, so you said that you, you've uh, meditated for uh, 30,000 hours. And uh, that was the number, correct, right? Yeah, yeah. roughly, yeah. yeah. And um, if that's 30,000 hours, people won't even go to Disneyland for 30,000 hours. So. I wonder if even just looking at this headset or this uh, experience as four dimensions, um, height, width, uh, length, and and time, um, completely ignores the fact that you can go inwards, and it's we just don't have a word for it or a number of words for thirty thousand hours of exploration um, in a dimension that isn't listed in height, length, width, and time. That, that's right. And <clears throat> you go into something that transcends any description that we can give in our current language. Right? But it could still be a dimension or a number of dimensions within. Well, yeah. In fact, it's, it, it, it's, it is. I, I would agree that it's, 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 it's an infinitely, it's an infinite, I'll put it, it's an infinite that you're going into, an infinity that you're going into, that, that is you. Mm. And it, an infinity that can be explored by trying on an infinite number of headsets, mm. and this is just one, one headset. So, every, so all we can do from this little space-time headset is is peer at ourselves, at who we are, from this set of of concepts and and perceptions. But this is one consciousness gets to look at itself from an infinite number of perspectives. This is, so this is, again, one of the cheaper perspectives, one of the simpler perspectives that consciousness is looking at itself from, from, from my point of view. So I, again, none yeah. of this I'm putting on the physicist. This is me going off. Trying to piece these on, different on breadcrumbs. That's right. Yeah. So I'm not blaming any of this or pinning any of this on, on the high energy theoretical physicist. Well, there is some connection between Newton studying, obviously, physics, but then also mm -hmm. theology. 
and alchemy. Like there, right. there must have been. It, it doesn't negate. It certainly doesn't seem for these individuals and uh, Einstein and his uh, admiration of Spinoza. Like it doesn't. It does not seem to exclude these other fields of of interest. I, I agree. And in, in the case of Leibniz, it's very very clear. So I mean, Leibniz oh, I invented know. the calculus mm -hmm. uh, uh, independently of Newton, and and did all sorts of other mathematical stuff. He was a complete genius. You know. He also came up with his own theory of consciousness, called, and he wrote it down in the monadology. So these things were called monads. I call them conscious agents. But I, I suspect that if Leibniz were here, he would he'd read my papers and and talk with me for a few minutes. He would grasp everything I've said because he's you know, he was a genius. He would grasp everything we've done properly in just a few minutes. Then he would correct us. <laughs> he, would, he would he would correct us and immediately then take off and, and take it in new directions where I couldn't keep up. But but his monodology he didn't write down mathematics. But see that was at the end of his life. I think the monodology was actually published. I think after he died. Mm. Um, so I you know if Leibniz had had another couple decades, he might have. And and the inclination he probably could have then started to write down mathematics of of. Of, of the monodology. But I, in some sense, I can say what I'm doing is, is basically um, my ideas are very, very similar to Leibniz's at, to, at top level. Um, and probably if, if Leibniz were here, he would look at my math and he would correct me and say, no, you need to do it this other way. Mm. And, and, uh, but then we would take off. Um, so yeah, so you, I, I, that's a long way of saying I agree with you that, that a lot of these scientists who were really making fundamental contributions to math and science, many of them, um, hadn't lost, they, they hadn't gotten themselves lost in space-time. They, they knew that there was something beyond space-time. They knew it on, um, <clears throat> not because they didn't know the neuroscience, which is what some people have said about Leibniz, right? He, he didn't believe that conscience, he, he thought the conscience was fundamental because he didn't know enough neuroscience. Mm. No, no, just because he, he was a very, very deep thinker. <clears throat> yeah. Well, Dr. Hoffman, thank you so much for the generosity of, of time and insight around this fascinating tip of the spear work that, yeah, might not even be my generation. Maybe it's another generation afterwards where it just becomes convention if uh, if what you're saying is true around space-time just no longer being seen as uh, as fundamental as well as dualism. If that doesn't, if of the idea of like you and I, we're obviously separate. If that is like the earth and the, and the sun, um, us actually revolving around the sun when it seems so obvious just watch it the sun is obviously revolving around us right and it being wrong uh that will be a a wild time when i mean ed vita vedanta has been saying this for eight thousand years but it is this very fringe philosophy it'll be wild times when if that becomes a convention where yeah of course we're rotating around the sun and of course you and i there is no duality between you and i at our conscious level. And, and when that happens, the technologies that we're going to invent outside of space-time will be mind-blowing. We won't have to travel from here to Andromeda Galaxy through space-time. We will go around space-time. Oh, that's right. Oh, we didn't even get into that. That's, that's right. so, okay, well, yeah. that'll some be for another conversation other around the implications of this. Right. Is yeah. Technology will be completely mind-blowing. Right, and it does, it's not just like, let's put you on your ass with this uh, crazy theory uh, no, it's no. more like, all right, now let's actually use it you, to you can, create you, you, yeah, the, wildly new innovation that's right. that is outside of uh, transistors. For a while, quantum theory was just this weird stuff. Now it's everywhere, and it's unbelievable. But this will blow quantum theory away. Mm, that's fascinating. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. Thank you.